Well, as you are seated, uh, we're gonna we're gonna start. Uh, one of the funnest things for me to do as a pastor is to be able to dedicate children. And uh, well, we've got uh, we got a number of children we're gonna be dedicating today. We have uh, two of them in this service today, and uh, I'd love to be able to invite up the parents of Levi Maddox and Ken and Kurtz. Can we welcome these guys to the stage? So good to see you parents. Yes. And I love to see this because this represents the heart of a parent. And I think the value that we recognize of life. Yes? And we as the church of God, we value the lives of these children because we know how delicately each one of them were created by the hands of God himself. As the scripture said, I knit you together in your mother's womb. God is so intricately involved in all of our lives, but we represent with these children that this is the beginning of this great adventure and this incredible hope that God created them for and all the amazing gifts and talents that he has created them with and they will be useful in his hands. And these parents, well, how many have children? All right, so you know what's coming. And it's all good, right? I mean, it's gonna be amazing. It's gonna be an amazing thing. You will get sleep again. It's gonna come, I promise. It will happen. It will happen for you. It's gonna be good. And uh, someday they're gonna say, thank you. Whereas right now, it's, it's not necessarily what's coming out of their mouth. But that's cool, it's gonna happen. But as we're dedicating our children today, we do this in the pattern of Hannah as she dedicated little Samuel to the Lord. And I love this passage of scripture that's found in 1 Samuel. She was unable to have children and so she knew the value of this gift of life. And so when she became pregnant, she was asking the Lord for a child and she became pregnant. Then she brings little Samuel back to the temple of the Lord where this prayer began. And here's what she said. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my request that I made to him. And therefore I have lent him back. I have given him back to the Lord as long as he lives. He is lent to the Lord. And she worshiped the Lord there with the high priest. What a beautiful, beautiful picture that you have here as they acknowledge this incredible gift. And now church, we want to just stretch out a hand and we wanna dedicate these two beautiful children, little Levi and Canon. So let's pray, church. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we come. And Lord, we recognize these two as the gifts that they truly are. Lord, these are amazing, created hopes that you have given to these families. And Lord, today we pray that all you intended for their life, that it will come to fruition. All these gifts, all these talents that you have placed in their life, the purposes of their life, that Lord, they will be able to follow into them, lean into them as they would grow in the Lord. I pray, Lord, for their homes, that this will be a beautiful, safe place where they begin to learn of who you are. They will experience your presence, Lord, first in their home and with mom and dad. Lord, I pray that it will be a sanctuary for them as they would know your presence. Lord, I pray that you will be with mom and dad and you will give them wisdom and you will give them discernment. You will give them patience and God, Lord, an understanding of grace at a level that we're truly unable to understand without having the responsibility of this child in our hands. It's just a whole different dynamic. But Lord, what an incredible picture of you to us. Lord, we pray that you will speak to these parents and enable them, enable them for this great task ahead. Lord, we pray over these children that you will guard their hearts, you will guard their minds, you will guard their bodies, and that they will learn to know you at the earliest possible age. 
and that, God, they will continue to grow in you. So now we dedicate them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And if we agree with the prayer, church, can we all say amen and amen, amen. Ah, wonderful, wonderful. Oh, yeah, well, let's thank them really, really loud. I love it, I love it. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> oh, yes, absolutely. So good, so good. Well, we are uh, going to be kind of preparing the stage here a little bit, but, you know, I love doing that because to me, that just so represents everything that we really are uh, as a church for the family and how we stand ready to be a help for all that God's intending to do in the lives of these children and uh, in our families and that we can, we, can, we can be trusted with the incredible gifts that God has placed all around us. So um, I want you to dig into your notes. If you don't have them up, you can go to the church app and of course tap on the series Committed at the top and the message notes will pop up and you can follow along there if you would like to. But we are in week four of our series Committed, and this is an amazing series because it helps us to recognize a number of different things about the generation that we are currently in. And what we realize is at this, port, this important time of the year that Daniel actually is told about the coming of Jesus you see, he, he actually knows that the Messiah is going to come. He's knowing and understanding it and hearing about it 600 years before the Messiah is to come. He doesn't know that his name will be Jesus yet, but he knows the Messiah is come. And so as he finds himself in Babylon, he recognizes that it is the Messiah, the example, the true presence of the living God. It is the presence and the path of God that he seeks as he finds himself here in Babylon, managing all of the currents that are pushing him this way and that way and forward and backwards that are coming at him in all kinds of different ways. And so here he is in recognizing truly how good God is because we recognize, he recognizes that God did not bring him to Babylon to abandon him but he brought him to Babylon so that he could learn how to walk closer to God. And he realizes that God is the one who truly is in control. I know that it's easy for us to look around at the circumstances and be pulled and pushed back and forth by all these currents continuously throughout the day and then still to wonder who's really in control of all this. But we have to recognize our faith is in the God that is truly working all of us into the same currents that are leading us to the day of the Lord, which is coming, the day when Jesus literally comes back and the church is brought together, that this history as we know it will be coming to an end and a whole new history will begin, the history of God's kingdom as uh, he has come and redeemed mankind. I mean, it's an incredible story. And really, Christmas is the, is, 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 is the birth of Jesus is bringing all of this to fruition, is the presence of the living God coming to earth and helping each one of us to recognize the presence of God and to find the Jesus path forward. So as a quick reference, if you haven't been with us Want to catch up real quick, Daniel, 605 BC, taken as a, as a young man, probably around 13, 14, 15 years old, from the city of Jerusalem as it's ransacked by Babylon. He's taken to Babylon, and there he finds a world that he could never have dreamed would have been possible. It's literally the antithesis, the opposite of everything that he knew in Jerusalem as he was looking to follow God there. Now, truly, there were a lot of people in Jerusalem not following God, but we believe Daniel most likely was one of those who was, and he knew what it was to follow God. He could do it there, but here in Babylon, oh, it was so much more difficult. The currents were against him, and even though uh, he finds himself here now, he's recognizing that truly God is the one in control, because even with Babylon, that was something God allowed 
Because truly the generations had gone on and on and on of a people who said, you know what, God, we don't want you in our life. And so God pulls back his protections. He pulls back his hands and says, okay, I'm gonna give you what you want. And what you want is slavery to Babylon. And so now they're experiencing this and we, we have to ask ourselves in this study, in this series, you know, why was Babylon so evil? And it was a lot, and we've talked about it in the past, a number of series uh, or messages, but uh, it was evil because life was cheap. It was evil because evil, depraved, broken people broke people at a rate that had never been before, at a level that was deeper than before. So much so that Babylon still today in scripture is known as the personification of evil. That's how evil and depraved Babylon was because there wasn't anything that you couldn't do if you wanted to do it in Babylon. And so what we recognize though is we live in a post-Christian society here in America. We're looking for insights to find how we can walk in the currents that are pushing us this way and that way, coming against us. Some of these currents are bad. Some of them are actually good and some of them are damaging. Some of them are neutral. When we look around, we have to say, I need wisdom, oh God. Anybody else need wisdom to manage the currents of our generation? Yeah, absolutely we do. And so Daniel's offering those to us. Here's our series thread. Our series thread is right here, to live a God-honoring life in a culture that does not always honor God. We start with keeping our commitment. That's how we begin to honor God. And so when we look at this, we also say, well, what's the message series uh, thread specifically for this part of the series? This is it right here. The message thread is Daniel knew he was not here to be abandoned, which I know that many have wondered. God, are you abandoning us? God never abandons a heart that is given to him. Even even in Jerusalem, when the people were taken captive back to Babylon, there was always, there was always a core. There was always this remnant that God would talk about, those who were following him with their whole heart. There was always that group. And God was protecting them and working with them and, and, and literally inspiring them and empowering them to live life at his side. And so we live in this same and we can expect the same. And what we have to know is that God has not abandoned us. Rather, we're in this generation right now. Like, what are we learning? We're learning how to walk closer to God. If we will have a heart to hear it and a mind to know it, we are here to learn what it is to walk closer to God. And as we do that, so many things begin making sense to us. Now, there were a couple tests for Daniel. His first test was this, Daniel's commitment to become a fierce follower of God. Was he going to pass this test and become a fierce follower of God? Well, we're finding that he is. The second test was this one. Daniel's second test is, uh, all right, Daniel's second test is to keep a commitment, I have to anchor deep into an identity. I have to anchor deep into an identity. Now, this identity piece, this is our third week on it, and the reason is because this is so crucial. Identity is one of these things that you hear about often in culture, but the problem with it is is that culture's idea of identity is so completely screwed up, it's so completely sideways from what God helps us to understand that identity is truly all about, and so we don't even know how to you know, use words in our current culture to even try to understand it. What we really, as the Christians, as followers of God do, we need to go to the scriptures to understand what, how does God talk about this idea of identity? How does he approach the topic? What are the words and the phrases and, and the things that are meaningful to him? And so Daniel chapter one has given us great insights to that. I wanna throw up this slide right here that helps us to understand some of these. We've gone through a number of these. I'm not gonna do it again today, but when you look at identity and the pieces of identity from just from chapter one, because Nebuchadnezzar, the enemy of Daniel's soul, was specifically undoing his identity and then rewriting it for him. Literally, literally pulling him apart and putting him back together in 
Nebuchadnezzar's in, in, uh, image. That's what he was attempting to do in chapter one. And he was doing this by saying, I own you. Yahweh was saying, you belong with me. Nebuchadnezzar says, I only care about the outward appearance. You better look good, Daniel. And when you don't, you don't have any more value to me. In fact, I don't even want to see you. That was literally true. Yahweh says, I care about the heart and the inward devotion. That's what I'm looking at. That's what I've seen. It's either beautiful or it isn't. What's going on inside of you? Nebuchadnezzar says, I'm gonna intentionally redefine truth and morality for you, Daniel. And God says, I am the standard of truth and morality, Daniel. Hold, hold with me, stand with me. Next slide. Nebuchadnezzar said, the demon gods provide for you. Don't even think about Yahweh. God says, I am your provider, Daniel. You're gonna have to make a choice. Who do you believe your provider to be? And it will make many choices for you. It will choose paths for you. We're gonna unpack this today. And then Nebuchadnezzar, he says, I'm gonna rename you to shape you into my image. Yahweh says, my name for you is my hope for you. And so we're gonna unpack these today. We're gonna finish this list. You're like, are you sure? <laughs> yes, yes, we're gonna finish it today, I promise. And so uh, here's, what we're, here's what we're gonna dive right into right now. We're gonna dive into this portion here where uh, we, we touched on it uh, last time where we were talking about the intentional redefining of truth and morality and how God is truly showing himself to be the standard of truth and morality. He's showing himself in this way, just like he did to the people when they came out of Egypt. What did he do? He immediately gave them a standard of truth and reality, what was different than what they knew in Egypt, because that defined for them their truth and reality. Egypt, life in Egypt, the gods of Egypt, and what they said was truth and morality. And God says, now you're my people. I want to show you what you were always intended for. And so I'm going to define for you because I am the standard. Now, Daniel's daily experience, his daily experience would have pushed back on the things of God. The people that he experienced, the people that he was in relationship with, that he had to work with every single day, they were pushing back on him and this standard of truth and morality. Culture's currents, they fought to redefine him. They fought to redefine the boundary lines of, of morality for him. We've talked about this a number of times, but let's look at it again, because some of us are just joining for the first time. In Babylon, just a few little pieces, women's value were as objects of sex. That was pretty much it. It was property to be sold at the highest bidder. We're at the marriage auctions. Take your young ladies there. They get sold to the highest bidder. We know that they were objects of sex. They were trained early in their identity. When they became uh, young ladies, they were immediately taken to the temple and they were, had to uh, prostitute themselves with the first stranger that came to them. It sounds abhorrent to us, but this is all a part of the shaping of their identity. These things all tell them what they're truly about and what their value is. Homosexuality was encouraged, sometimes even forced. Sex outside of your marriage was required for religious reasons. Babies had little to no value. You could keep them, you could throw them away. It was your choice. Polygamy, good to go. Pedophilia, good to go. Victims and victimizers, abound in Babylon. Like I said, anything goes in Babylon. And that's why when we look at Babylon, we recognize that the, the, the standard of morality is not one that the people of God were going to jump into, that they were going to choose if they were gonna follow God because God's way is literally the opposite in so many of these things. And Daniel was anchored deep as these shifting currents were always swelling around him. Is this making any sense to us, church? Is this making sense to us? There's currents all around us trying to, trying to shape us, trying to say, just go with it. Just accept this little piece. Just accept this really big piece. Jump into this current and act like it's normal. What I love about Heights Church is that we have anchored deep 
anchored deep into Jesus, and we don't forget also what it was like to be at the mercy of the currents. Because as we talk about these things, it's, I realize these are very serious issues, but really, this is our experience. This is the everyday life you're dealing with. And if you're going to be able to manage yourself well in the currents of a post-Christian nation, then we've got to understand who the standard of truth really is. And we're gonna to have to exercise our faith like never before exercise our faith, but find ourselves recognizing that the example of Daniel is that this man lasted for three kings, four kings, actually, three kings past Nebuchadnezzar because God was so good to show him the path forward. So in faith, absolutely, this can be done. And I love this. I want you to hear these words because, because as we talk about these things, I want you to know it's in humility. It's in humility. Hear these words. Let these wash over you. Titus chapter three, verse three through seven. Here's what God did. God did this. Once we too were foolish and disobedient. Did you hear that? He said, hey, we're, 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 we're not these uh, incredible, uh, pristine people that have never done anything wrong. Oh, no, 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 no. Once we too were foolish and disobedient, we were misled. We became slaves to many lusts and pleasures. In fact, our lives were filled with the evil and envy. And listen to this. We hated each other. But when God our Savior revealed his kindness and his love, he saved us not because of the righteous things that we had done, the righteous things you did, the righteous things that you did. No, that's not why he saved us. He saved us because we needed being saved. We needed to be saved. He saved us not because of our righteous things, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth, a new life through the Holy Spirit. And he generously poured out the Spirit on us. God pours his spirit in us so that we are now able to live a different life through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And because of his grace, it says, he made us right in his sight, gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. That's grace. That's the amazing grace of God. Absolutely. It is worth cheering for because this is what God has done. But God didn't save me to the currents of my generation. If that were the case, I don't need his help. I can do that all on my own, yes? We can do that, that's easy. That takes nothing except getting in my inner tube, my little ducky inner tube, and hanging out in the currents and let them take me anywhere I want that it wants to take me, yes? And this is what so many people are doing. Oh, I got my little floaties on. I'm just floating in the current. I'm not kicking against it. I'm just gonna float down the river in whatever current, wherever it takes me is where we're gonna go. Well, this is not the church. This is not Christ. This is not how we walk. This isn't the Jesus path forward whatsoever. It is to know what the standard of truth and morality is. And I didn't say be obnoxious as we know it. I just said know it and then handle ourselves wisely with love and with kindness and recognize this grace and this mercy that has come to us and know that God gave it to us so that we could receive it, be transformed by it, and then give it away ourselves. Yahweh did that. He is the standard of truth. And then we, we get to do this. And we find this in Colossians chapter three, one through 17. I'm not gonna read all those verses, but here's what it says. You and I, because God is the standard of truth and morality, we set our sights on the realities of heaven. That's where we put our eyes. That's where we put our hearts. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth, for you died to this life. That's the goal for each one of us to die to this life. So he says, put to death the sinful, earthly things lurking within you and have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater 
In other words, putting those things up in front of the, the, the path of God, when I put something in front of God and I say, no, this is of greater value, I have just made it an idol in my life, worshiping the things of the world, because these sins will bring the anger of God. That's what it says. This is found in Colossians chapter three. This is right here. And then it says, you used to do these things. You used to do these things. I'm here talking about these things as one not perfect, but forgiven. And as we would speak anything to our generation, we don't speak of perfection. We speak from forgiveness and from mercy. Yes, that's how we talk. And so yes, we are greatly sobered but we speak with humility, recognizing how simple and easy it is to flow in these currents and how difficult it can be to stand. You used to do these things when your life was still part of this world. The English Standard Version, I like how it says it. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them away. It's like well old, worn shoes. It's like these shoes that, you know, those comfy shoes, the one you want to put on every day, but, you know, you really shouldn't because they've got holes in them or they smell or they have stains on the outside, but they feel so good. It's like well-worn shoes. He says, I know, it's easy for you to go right back into them because it's the thing that, that you know so well, but it's time. It's time to take those shoes off and put them away. And let's find the new things that become your new, your new comfort, the new comfort for you. Now it's time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, dirty language. Put on your new nature to be renewed as you learn to become like him. When we talk about the standard of truth and morality. This is Daniel. This is what he's doing literally by himself. And then there's three other guys that are gonna join him. We'll talk about that soon. But he's doing this by himself regardless of what any of them do. He said, no, no, I know who the standard of truth and morality is and I'm going to follow that standard. And then I love this. Make allowance for each other's faults because we really need to do that. And I wonder, are we doing that? There's a lot of people faulting out there are we making allowances for those? I just was talking to a friend this week who had another call from a life, like decades long friend, chewing him out, cutting him off because he didn't agree with certain things like masks and ending decades old friendships over things that truly aren't worth losing these incredible relationships in our life for. Are we making allowances for one another's faults? Well, the scripture says this is exactly what we should be doing. We're following the path of Jesus when we do. Forgive anyone who offends you and remember the Lord forgave you. So you must, not it's a good idea. Hey, maybe. You must forgive others. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of Jesus Christ. Wow. Anybody hear that one? Do it as a representative of Jesus Christ. Yes. Everything we do, everything that we say, every way that we come into a room, exist in it, and leave that room, we do it as a representative of Jesus Christ. What an incredible privilege we have. What an incredible gift we've been given to represent Christ. He said, well, I'm not sure that I signed up for that. Oh, you did. That's what it means when Jesus says, follow me. Become like me. Otherwise, just do what you're doing. Put your floaties on and get to the currents. They'll take you wherever they want you to go. You're not gonna find what you want, but it will be easier for you for a while. One of the most influential pieces of our identity is our morality, and we should absolutely not think anything different. Daniel absolutely knew this about his life, and he was steadfast. 
The enemy of Daniel's soul even sought to rename him so that he could redefine his morality with a name. This is incredible. There's a slide up here for this. Belteshazzar is the name that Daniel was given. May Marduk, the god of Babylon, the chief god of Babylon, protect his life. Daniel's actual name says, God is my judge. He's the one who is here to help me. He is the one who is here to give me success and to show me the path forward. Belteshazzar is simply a name trying to make sure that this standard no longer exists in Daniel's life. He's trying to rename him. Shadrach, a friend of Daniel's, was given the name, or I should say Hananiah was given the name, uh, which is an unclear reference, but it is honoring Marduk, which takes away the honoring of Hananiah. My God is gracious. No, 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 we don't want him to talk about that. I want you thinking of Marduk. Forget Yahweh. Mishael, who is what God is? It is an encouragement to think on how powerful and how good and gracious and amazing and sovereign God truly is. Meshach is his name, which is who is what Aku, the moon god. Get Yahweh out of your life. Azariah, the Lord is a help. No, 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 we don't want you thinking about Yahweh. I want you to think about Nebo. You are now a servant of Nebo because if you forgot, I own you. I own you and I will beat you into submission. You will do what I tell you to do. This was the environment they were in, and yet, as they sought God, his protection, his help, his path forward was always found. And I wonder, as we think about our names, we're still thinking about this whole idea of morality, I think about the names that we've been given, the names that we've taken on, the names that other people have given to us, and I'm wondering if that's part of our identity and God's trying to undo it. God, God's trying to undo the identity that other people are placing on you. It's common for us to think of ourselves as dirty, as worthless, as unwanted, as a mistake, as a loser, someone who just keeps losing time and time again, someone who is ugly and unlovable, someone who is incapable, someone who is unworthy, someone who just doesn't measure to be enough. Well, we think about these things all the time. And too many of us, this is part of the makeup of who our identity is. It's really no different. It's really no different than what Nebuchadnezzar was trying to do to Daniel and his friends. I'm gonna rename you. Those are the names. Those are the names you're gonna be thinking about every time God asks you to step out. Nah, but I can't. I can't do that great thing because I'm a loser. I never win. God wouldn't ask me to do that. I'm unwanted. When we look at these names, we gotta realize that God's turning them around. I'm not dirty. I am cleansed. I'm not worthless, I am priceless. Jesus gave his life for mine. I'm not unwanted. He has sought me through the annals of history. He has sought me out with his grace. I am not a mistake. I was created in the image of God by his own hands. I'm not a loser. I'm an overcomer in Christ. I'm not ugly. I am beautiful in the sight of God. My father as a son or as his daughter, he's the one that I look to for whether or not I am ugly or beautiful. And he says that I I am handsome and woo, do I look good. <laughs> can I get a witness? You can drop it in the chat. Absolutely, you can drop it in the chat. I am not incapable. I'm absolutely capable because God has gifted and called me. I'm not unworthy. I am made worthy in Jesus and I am enough as I stand at the side of God. This is how it works. This is who we are. This is our identity. And if you have taken on a name in your identity that doesn't represent God's standard of truth, then you need to understand God's trying to undo that. He's trying to redefine you into the image of Christ, help you to follow him who you were created to be, just like these children up here. God created them in incredible ways. And now it is their path and the path of their parents to help them find that. Yahweh is not degrading people's value. He is the one revealing it. So when we look to God's word, we realize, oh yeah, we're in this world, 
but we are not of this world. Followers of Jesus are the ones who are living into a higher morality by putting the value of priceless on all people's lives. No matter if it's a male or a female, no matter what the skin color is, no matter what their education level is, no matter what differences our society is trying to say, they matter more. No, no, no. We're the ones who understand Yahweh is the standard of truth and he tells me every single one of us was exchanged for the life of his son. That's what he offered. And there is no greater price. I will never devalue this incredible priceless thing. And that's how we seek every single day to live our lives. And that's why it matters that no matter what room we're in, we are always representing Christ. We don't need a standard to align with if we already agree. But obviously we don't agree on all things. And you're sitting here and some of these things, you say, well, I I don't agree with what God says about this. I don't agree with what God says about that. Yeah, I get it. And that's what faith is for. That's what discipleship is for. That's what's growing in Christ is for. And we put our faith in God to say, but I know, I disagree, but I know that you are the standard of truth. You are the standard of morality. So the question's back to me. Will I exercise my faith towards what you have said and how you have defined truth and morality? Daniel anchored his faith and his identity in God alone. And yeah, Daniel's story challenges every one of us, challenges every one of us, not to put the floaties on and just go with the currents, but to stand strong, to stand strong in the truth and the morality of God. As I said before, not in an obnoxious way, but to stand strong in the reality of God. Daniel knew he was not here to be abandoned, He was here to learn how to walk closer to God, which meant there were all kinds of decisions every single day he would experience in the palace on the streets of Babylon that he would say yes or no to. These are the questions. These are the same questions you and I are being asked. Yes? Yes. This is where we're at. Identity is huge. It cannot be undersold. It cannot be underestimated. Verse 5 last thing we're going to talk about today, says that the demon gods of Babylon will provide for you. They are your provider, Daniel. And Yahweh says, no, no, no. I am your provider. Now, this is huge again. Like, wow, you're taking on two big ones today, Craig. Yep, I am. Because that's where God's word takes us. You see, being God, our provider is all about God being our provider. You see, some of us are under the delusion that whatever I do, I do by myself and that God has nothing to do with it, that my job, my money, my talents, what comes into my life, what leaves my life, that God has nothing to do with any of those things, that my life is truly what I make of it all by myself. And it is a delusion. That is not what God's word says whatsoever. There's no way that we could look at Daniel's story and say, oh yeah, man, he is one smart young man. 14-year-old kid winds up in Babylon's court and oh yeah, he just made some really good decisions. God had nothing to do with it. God didn't respond when he asked. Daniel never had to ask because he just always knew it. He was a self-made man. That is not the truth of his story whatsoever. It's not the truth of any story in Scripture. It helps us. It challenges us. In fact, it asks us. It demands. It requires that we would exercise our faith to understand God as our provider at every level and depth of our life. You can't choose a topic in your life, in your heart, your mind, your soul, that you can't recognize that God is your provider. Daniel knew this, which is why he made a choice not to, not to align himself with the demon gods of Babylon, but to say, God will provide for me. And he knew it was a foundational decision that would lead him and guide him for the rest of his life. I love this. Jeremiah 2.13, for my people have done two evil things. 
They have abandoned me, walked away. They have walked away from the fountain of living water. And here's what they did. They dug for themselves cisterns or wells that are cracked cisterns that can hold no water at all. But for some reason, they wanna be self-made people and say, we're gonna do what we can do. And if I can't do it, it can't be done, but I'm certainly gonna be upset that I still don't receive the blessing of all that I wanted when I dig a well that's already broken and instead of going to God's well. I'm just gonna walk away from God's well. I'm gonna try to dig my own. And we see people doing this. I'm tempted to do it throughout my life as well. And we have to recognize this is not what God wants. He wants us to keep coming back to him, the fountain of life. I'm reminded of a blended family here in our church where, where one of them tithed and one of them did not. And then when they came together, they started talking about it. They said, well, wait a minute. You need to understand what God's done in my life. So I wanna challenge you to exercise your faith in this. So the, other, the spouse did. And the next thing you know, all kinds of doors began to open for them. Finances started breaking loose in ways that they had been hoping would take place for years, but hadn't been. But this is real. You say, Craig, why are you talking about finances? Well, because I'm supposed to bring the whole counsel of God. And I know when it comes to provision, you can't talk about provision without talking about finances. And so many of us are wondering, what is going on? And what's going on is that we're not honoring God as our provider with our finances. You can't see the evidence of it in our life. We're doing it our way. We're doing it the way we want it. We're self-made people. We're digging our own cisterns and saying, God, yours isn't enough. But God says, listen, I want you to honor me with your morality and as your provider, because I'm big enough to handle this. I can do this. This is who I am. This is who I want to be in your life. Why do pastors talk about finances in the church? And I'm saying that because I hear that from people. People ask me these questions or they ask other people these questions and they get back to me. And they say, oh, man, you know, churches are always talking about finances. Well, it's because finances is actually one of the most talked about topics in the entire scripture because God knows. It holds the key to whether or not he is your provider or something else is? Am I relying on myself and what I can do? Or am I relying on God to be my provider? It's talked about over 2,500, that's 2,500 times in scripture. And I am meant to bring the whole counsel of God to us. And you can't do that without talking about finances. And I know that finances always makes the list of the greatest uh, frustrations of people. You do any survey, it's gonna make the list and it's gonna be in the top five, if not top three, if not top two. Greatest frustrations in their life. So why wouldn't we talk about it? Of course we would, because this is the thing that God knows is so crucial to my life and to yours. And he wants to help. He wants to talk to us about what he's provided and God stands ready to pour out a blessing on us as we walk in obedience to him when it comes to our finances. God says, give me the portion to fill my storehouse so that I can provide for my community, for my people in your city, and then you are gonna live off the rest of that and wow, Am I gonna bless the rest of that? I think about a couple here at our church. They said I could name them. Their names are Luke and Crystal. And it was just in this uh, COVID era that, well, both of them really, right prior to COVID, came to faith, really came back to their faith. And uh, they started dating and uh, they started walking a whole different path for their life. And uh, one thing led to another and they said, you know what, it's time to get married. And when they got, we're about to get married, uh, they we're getting married, they were going through the process of buying a home. And as soon as they bought the home, wouldn't you know it, Crystal lost her job. And now they're thinking, what are we gonna do? We're gonna lose the house. So Luke says, well, I'm gonna jump in. I'm gonna save this. I'm gonna do it. I'm the man. I'm supposed to jump in. I'm supposed to save things. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna move in and we're gonna make this happen. But there was a problem because they had already, they had already created a, a new standard of morality for them in themselves. And they said, no, 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 no. You see, Yahweh is the standard of morality. So we're waiting, we're waiting to have 
intimacy until we get married. See, we're not going with the currents. We're not wearing the floaties of the, and going down the currents of, of our generation. We're not doing that. And we're not moving in together because, you see, and as Luke said it to me, he goes, that's Luke's way. And I've already seen what Luke's way does. That's what God saved me from. And so I'm not gonna do it Luke's way. I'm just gonna trust God. I'm gonna pray my guts out. I'm gonna walk before him. Crystal said, yep, that's what I'm doing too. We're not gonna budge. We're gonna trust God. He is our provider. Within weeks, Crystal had three job offers, three of them. The one she took gave her a 30% raise from the previous job that she had. Luke got a promotion, another promotion, and raises all within the next months after they made this decision. So by the time they get married, oh yeah, God had shown himself to be provider in their life. But listen, they, they made choices. They made choices to know that God is the standard of morality for them. Yes? And they also made a choice to recognize that God is their provider. And they know they can trust him and they don't have to break his truth and morality in order to become self-made people, to do it Luke's way, to do it Crystal's way. They can do it Jesus' way, and God is their provider through the whole thing. Who is your provider? Make your decision to find your identity in Jesus. Follow him every step of the way and just know that at every point, that you can't get past it on your own, God's gonna create a way. Because that's what God does over and over and over again. And I look and I ask the question in my own life, what could be used as evidence, Craig, to show that God is your provider? It's a good question. It's a good question for all of us to ask ourselves. Whether we're in person or sitting in our living rooms or out on a job, wherever it is, and you're in your car listening to this, what evidence is in our lives that would show that God is our provider? What can I do? What do I do to exercise my faith that God is my provider? Do I acknowledge it in prayer? Do I even acknowledge that in prayer to God? Do you tell others about God's provision in your life when you have the opportunity to do it. Are you generous with your time, your talents, and your treasures with God? Are you trusting that he's gonna give you more? Are you grateful for his provision? Do you even acknowledge that God is your provider? Hey, the, we changed our prayer before dinner a few years ago because we realized we don't need to bless this because Becky's a great cook. I don't need to ask God's blessing on it. It's already gonna taste awesome. We changed our prayer to say, God, thank you for the provision. Thank you for taking good care of us and our family. Thank you that this is in front of us today because you brought it to us. Daniel knew he was not here in Babylon amongst all these currents to be abandoned. He was here. He was here to learn how to walk closer to God. Daniel had choices to make about his identity. Daniel had choices to make. Am I a slave to Babylon? Am I a servant to God? Am I abandoned or will I learn to walk closer to God? But, 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 but. I got a whole list of buts too. And my answer to all of them is my faith. Faith is a shield to protect you, whether it's truth and morality or whether it is God as my provider. In the scriptures, it says, faith is a shield. Here's what Ephesians 6 says. Put on the full armor of God so you'll be able to stand against all the strategies of the evil one. Stand your ground. And in addition to all of these, it says, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows or bolts of the enemy. History tells the story of a man named Sceva. He was a low-level warrior, uh, uh, just, uh, just army soldier, in Rome, 48 BC, he's fighting for Caesar in Greece and they've got a fortification and they're trying to defend this. Sceva fought like a madman. And when it was all done, he fought so fiercely that Caesar rewarded him with a vast sum of money. He promoted him eight ranks and the proof 
that he used when Caesar was writing this down, he used as the evidence for why he did this for Sceva was because he said Sceva presented his shield. His shield from this battle alone had 120 bolts of the enemy stuck in it. Every time the enemy came at him to destroy him, he raised that faith, that shield, and said, no, no, no. And that is exactly what Paul says to us when it comes to our faith and standing our ground and truth and morality and God is our provider and every other truth that God's word speaks to. We lean into it with a shield of faith and those bolts of the enemy that come at us to destroy us, faith takes the blow, not me. And this is where we're at. And I wonder, how would God ask you to exercise your faith in these topics that we're talking about? I know it's big. Morality and truth, God is my provider. I know God's speaking. I know his Holy Spirit has already put his finger on a few things. Daniel knew his identity. Daniel knew who his faith was in. So he raised his shield every single day and he walked his way through a lifetime in Babylon. He knew he was the one being helped, not hurt. He knew he was the one being rescued, not rejected. He was in Babylon's world, but not of this world. Father, as we come to this moment now, as your word has challenged us in incredible ways and, Lord, sobering ways, we recognize that some of us have some pretty hard choices to make and others of us are saying, thank you, oh God, for being so clear to me all those years ago that today I get to walk in these things and I recognize the blessing that has been poured out on my life Maybe I forgot to say thank you for it recently, but I'm reminded again who my provider is. I'm reminded again that you truly are the standard of truth and morality, and I, in faith, continue on my journey. But if you're here today and you recognize, whether you're online or you're present, you say, you know what? God has challenged me. There are some things he's put his finger on. You say, listen, you're not exercising your faith here. You're not exercising your faith here. This is life about you. This is your best idea. This is you giving into the current, putting the floaties on and just doing whatever is easiest for you. But that's not something God is going to bless because it's not how it works. But when we stand up in faith to stand our ground, then God gives us strength to stand that ground. He doesn't give me strength to be carried by the currents of culture. He gives me strength to stand against them, not in an obnoxious way, but in a way that shows wisdom, grace, and mercy and recognizes that I was once a child of Babylon too. And I know the incredible work of restoration that my God could do. And so my invitation is to you to come and to join this journey at the side of Christ with me. This was Daniel's life as we see it at the close of chapter one. I'm wondering if we're here, if you're online, you could just drop it in the chat. Yes, pray for me, pray for me, pray for me. You can drop that in the chat. If you're here in person, you say, you know what? God did say something. There was something he's put his finger on. I wanna acknowledge it. And I want you to pray for me, Pastor Craig. Would you just lift a hand right now and say, yep, that's me. That's me. He put his finger on something. Go ahead. <laughs> Everybody's hand, truthfully, should be raised at this point because I know that none of us are perfect. But as God has put something on your heart, get it up there and say, yes, this is something I'm meant to engage God with. Father, you see our hands, you know. And God, I pray for the power of your Holy Spirit to come and to do incredible things now to help us that we would stand, not just go with the currents of culture, but to stand strong and to know exactly how to do it in a life-giving way and in a way that represents Jesus to our generation not representing my best ideas and what's just easiest, but God, 
truly to follow your word and to trust it, to trust it. And Father, I find it so incredible to know that Sceva could be promoted eight ranks after one battle. And I look at Luke and Crystal's life and I think, Lord, that's what you did for them. One battle. And look how you blessed them. Lord, it's the thing that none of us expect. It's the thing that none of us truly can know how you will bless. But Lord, today we put our faith to know that you will help us and you will be our provider as we stand strong in Jesus. And Father, if you're here, anybody here today who'd say, I wanna become a follower of Jesus, whether you're online or whether you're a person, if you're online, you could just drop in a, a link into the chat right now. You can tap onto that. If you're in person and you say, yes, I wanna become a follower of Jesus today. I wanna make that commitment with my life. If that's you, just, just lift a hand right now. I wanna pray with you before we go. Anybody over here to my right? Anybody over here to my... Coming across the middle. Yeah, thank you. Anybody here to my left say, that's me. All right, let's pray then. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for your incredible grace. I ask for your forgiveness today. I ask that you would forgive me of my sin. Wash my mind and my heart clean. But Lord, I pray that you will fill me now with your Holy Spirit. Thank you that as your word says, and I can trust it, I am forgiven. I am washed clean through Christ and his work on the cross. And Lord, today I receive your Holy Spirit into my life, that you will be present with me from now into eternity. Thank you for the incredible gift of eternity that you have given to me. And Lord, I will now live a life grateful at your side. And we pray it all in the mighty name of Jesus. If we agree with the prayer church, can we say amen together? Amen. Amen together. Yes, God's word to you. Oh, isn't it beautiful? Isn't it amazing? And isn't it so crystal clear for us as we would hear it today? Thank you. Thank you for having God's heart for you. And now I wanted to just say a word, uh, a quick word uh, about um, our giving. I just wanted to say thank you for all that you're doing. And I know that as we have talked about God as our provider, it's one of those things that we recognize that hey, this is, uh, this is part of that provision and knowing that God wants to take what we give to him and use it and touch lives and ask the question, what is the evidence in my life that God is my provider? And obviously my giving has something to do with that. My prayer for you today is that you would ask God, how can I join you with my finances and my time and my talents so that we can walk together on this and you can touch other people's lives like I'm being blessed and touched by this church and this ministry as well, whether you're person or whether you're online. And there's different ways to give, the smart giving, which is here uh, on our screen. You can give that way. You can mail this in to the physical address here. And we receive your offering that way and it's completely safe as well as our give buttons on our website or our app. But thank you for joining us and knowing that God is our provider and moving forward together. So 